I was thinking a lot about just growing up on the border and having this dual personality. Changing her country each day is definitely part of the work. It was this idea they had of East and West meeting, opening up cross-cultural references, how everybody gains when we are open to the other. It just connects us, and it just brings out our humanity. My work intersects old technology and new technologies. Which allow her to make a kind of art the world has never seen. Tis a gift to be simple, tis, tis a gift to be free, tis a gift to go where you want to be, and when you find yourself so So I do sculptures, furniture, site-specific installations for museums, and then I pay my bills by making jewelry and accessories. Yeah, just lots of stuff. Lots and lots of stuff. It all grows in and out of playing around with disciplines and materials, but but not abandoning, I think, what, where I started. So now we're getting closer and closer and closer to the border. And that little, like, hazy horizon is Tijuana already. You know, my parents both live there. My sisters and I all grew up in Tijuana. It's, it's a safe place for me and for my family. My grandmother had nine kids. She had seven girls and two boys. And my dad is one of the two boys. My mom, she was, she was, she was a U.S. citizen, born uh, in Azusa, California. One of the reasons why we're living here in Mexico instead of living in the States, because I didn't want my kids to be unattached to their country. So they will, the roots will be pulling them and feeling that they're Mexicans. As a kid in Tijuana, I grew up in the very, very tiny, tiny house. The block that we lived in was not the best block as far as looks go, but it was, everybody knew everybody. Um, I was always a really, really outgoing kid. So if a new person moved into one of the houses, I'd go knock on the door and say, do you have any children? And how many children? And what are the ages and their gender? You know, and they would tell me, oh, there's a this girl, this boy, this girl. And I'd request the one that was closest to my age. And it was a girl. And I'd say, well, is that one available? And could she come and play? My dad and I would cross the border every day and I would get dropped off at my grandma's house and then go to school close to my grandma's house. And it wasn't because my parents wanted me to go to school in the U.S. It was because they didn't have a babysitter. And so my grandmother lived on the U.S. side, and so then they just, by default, I just ended up being dropped off in the U.S. It was pretty tough, though. It was really, really tough because well, we'd have to leave the house like 3.34 in the morning for us to be able to cross the border and get to the U.S. side in time for my dad to go to work. So I would get dropped off at my grandma's house sometimes around 5.30 in the morning and then just wait for people to wake up. Yeah, and so a lot of these blankets are the types of blankets that I use in the weavings that has all the crazy colors in it. I definitely feel the freedom to work with whatever material I want to. 
I guess it's a little bit like improvising with the material and just kind of letting the material dictate where the composition is going. So it's a little bit like painting with material. My exploration into color and texture comes from the Mexican side of me and the cleaner lines and more minimal aesthetic come from the U.S. side of me. I'm just really drawn to the spirit of her work. Tanya puts all of herself into the littlest detail of what she does. The texture and feel of her pieces, I think, completely res relates to her own sense of self and her own environment. And her pieces have this surface texture that's sort of reaching out to everything around it. Everywhere you place one of her pieces, it suddenly feels at home. With Tanya, it's about the concept. And it's about creating something that she hasn't done before and it's about the process. It's all about the process that I respect about the artist and that I cannot, as you know, I, I don't understand. Well, I was at the Rhode Island School of Design working on my thesis for grad school. I was thinking a lot about just growing up on the border and having this kind of dual personality where sometimes I was one thing on one side of the border and then on the other side, you know, I'd have to become something else to fit in. And so I was thinking of a lot of stuff that had to do with dualities. Because I was studying how to make furniture, I started thinking about if there was a chair that I could work with and transform into the opposite of what it was, but still letting it retain most of its personality. And um, so that's kind of how the felt chair idea came out, was just taking something that was super cold and uninviting and transforming it into something soft. It comes as Raul. And then through the process of hand rubbing it for 20 hours, <laughs> it becomes felt. So it's like making a gigantic dreadlock, but just around a chair. <laughs> Which is what Carla's currently doing. It's her work, I respect it. I want it to be perfect as if she was doing it. Tanya has been like, you know, she's my best friend. She's my mentor. She's my boss. She got me introduced to art because when I was a kid, she kind of noticed that I really liked drawing, so she would buy me art supplies and take me to like art classes. She always tried to push us to do whatever we enjoyed doing, whether it was Carla drawing or even when I was really into writing, she would always kind of make us, you know, push us to keep doing that. Yeah. You see, this is like, <laughs> show me your tricks. Tanya has been felting for like, about like seven or eight years now. So a lot of the felting now comes to me because she's just like really sick of it. And it used to be like this, this process that was really friendly and really amazing, but then it just takes so long that you just kind of like hate it at some point. <laughs> Cause it's like doo doo doo, you know? Getting into felting didn't have to do with a love of felt. It had to do with wanting to learn a technique that I could take to small places that didn't have electricity, running water, or anything like that, and teach people a skill that could help them earn some income. Early on with Tanya, she felt a responsibility to support where she came from and support the underdog. This is the community of Maclovio Rojas in what was the outskirts of Tijuana, but now seems to be more and more connected to the rest of Tijuana. I started coming here in, I believe, 1997. And when I started coming here, it was with the Border Art Workshop. And so this community is really special. 
this place was settled mainly by women. And when I got here in 97, there was already over 8,000 families. This entire place is scrapped together. And so the motto here was pound to fit, paint to match. And so it was just whatever we could get our hands on, we would make use of. We had a lot of different projects going on throughout the community. One of them was to build this community center that was to, to stand as a, as a beacon, as a, a ship of kind of freedom and education. The art that was created out of this community center was a really, really important part of what was happening because it was a way for them and us to help them tell the story of this community. When we would talk to the women about how it was that they settled this land, they would talk about that they would lay down and they would cover themselves. And then um, rattlesnakes would go in underneath the covers and sleep with them at night to keep warm. And then the women would wake up in the morning, chop off their heads and eat them for breakfast. And so it was just always a really beautiful way for us to think about how strong the women of this community were, are and just how amazing, you know, the circumstances in which they founded this, this area. My experience in Maclovio Rojas inspired me to become an artist. It also just really taught me to trust and love working with other people. Okay, so then we have, these are the doubles. Okay, those are singles. The singles, and then there's mediums that are inside there as well. They're just like kind of off-white. We have such a obsession with Sammy. <laughs> so we're like, Sammy can say this. Jewelry is what allows for all the other things to happen because there's a larger market, and especially with the internet. People from all over the world can have these products available. So a lot of the times we get really big orders and because everything is made by hand, we can't really catch up. Let's move this over closer to you. We don't outsource anything. Like, so they have to understand that no. we do it all by hand, so. Yep. There's, um, if we need doubles in chartreuse, She's a teacher at Otis College of Art and Design. So at the end of my junior year, she's like, oh, would you like to be one of my interns? And I was like, okay, sure. So that's where it started. It was kind of like a little experiment each class where she would like show us a new thing. She would like bring her burners to class and like show us how to like boil leather and weave and dye things. I was thinking about lines and what did lines mean. You know, one of the first things that I thought about was the line is the border and the line is artificial boundaries. So the space is really laid out with all these artificial boundaries because if you really wanted to get through it, you know, it's just string. You could just, you know, go through stuff. But then also I was thinking about how my work crosses in between functional and non-functional, fine art and craft, um, traditional and modern. It just makes sense for me to be able to play with whatever I want to play with and not really stay within a certain definition of what people call me. I think it's a very frontier sensibility about making work and about yeah, just how you're defined as a person.
right? No matter what Bernard did, he always wore a jacket and tie. And you see him here throwing in the studio with a white shirt and a tie on. People sometimes ask me, how do you know when it's in the middle of the wheel? And one's almost stumped to answer because the answer lies so very much in the doing. As soon as it's steady and unmoving, silent as I called it, it's obviously centered. A Potter's Book by Bernard Leach. It had just been published in America. And so we all tried to get a copy of this book and we read it and he said, boy, this is exciting. The Potter's Book is my Bible. And I fell in love with the pots that Leach made, his philosophy. It was a big part of what made better standards in American pottery. And we tried to throw a pot on the potter's wheel. Of course, we made a mess. We had, we had wasted clay. We had clay all over the place. And we almost got thrown out of school. But uh, it did get us started. One day, my first wife, Alex, and I contacted Leach and asked him if we could come and talk about apprenticing with him. We went to England and spent two and a half years there at the pottery. This amateur film about the Leach pottery was taken in 1952 by my two American students, Warren and Alex McKenzie. The idea was to make a visual recording of the normal sequence of work at our pottery at St. Ives, for the sake largely of students and other potters who either have not the opportunity to visit us, or who want to see how we have attempted to assimilate oriental tradition and technique to suit our English needs. We were not making our own pots. We were making uh, leech pottery pots. And those, what we called standard ware pots, were illustrated in a catalog. I became an apprentice, this is 1968. Bernard Leach was 82 at the time. He worked every day in the studio. He had a private space upstairs and we were told to not disturb him. It was his time to work. And we'd see him at tea time. They started me out on a, a fairly simple, what I thought was a simple shape. And it was a humbling experience. I cut my teeth on this lidded soup bowl. I made these for two months before they reached a certain standard where they could be sold. We were on a three-week firing schedule, so we made pots for two weeks. Then we stopped and had glazed chores and firing duties. And then we started all over again. Lovely rhythm, very supportive rhythm. But we also had the freedom to stay after work and to go up on weekends and make our own pots. And Bernard would critique them. And the cutting of the foot. It's something that we have learnt and are still learning from our Eastern masters. Leach was in Japan studying. He met Hamana. They became friends. And they became part of this Minge movement together. Uh, Minge is a made-up word. I think they said that the, this group made the word up. It has to do with being people's art, folk art. And they had this anonymous quality of the fact that the potters were simply doing a job. They were doing a job like we would talk about an auto mechanic repairing our car. He doesn't do it with any great panache or anything, but uh, we want it to be right, you know? And that's the way they, they wanted their work to be. It just had to be right. When Leach 
was invited to return to England and start a pottery. Hamada said, I will go with you. And so he went to England with Leach and they built the pottery together. They went out and found clays that would work. They found a supply of wood to burn in the kills. And in fact, Hamada lived in the main building of the pottery. That was his bedroom. And he had a, a, a handmade bed that he, he made that uh, was still there when we, we were there. Hamada Leach meshed perfectly because of this idea they had of East and West meeting and coming to some new kind of uh, sense of, of what the human race could evolve into. To those ideas of opening up cross-cultural references, uh, how everybody gains when we are open to the other. Hmm, now, how, how do I put it? <laughs> I think Hamada was a much better potter than Leach. But the reason for that is Leach was a much better draftsman than he was a potter. Bernard brought pots to life in his sketches. And then when he made the pot, he was simply copying the drawing, but doing it with clay. Hamada made his pots on the wheel, and that's where they were created. Soji Hamada was a genius, you know. So in spite of my continuing to want to define this whole thing as craft as opposed to art, some people surpass it. The lusciousness, the robustness, the, the materials, everything about it was just wonderful. So sumptuous and wonderful. Certainly part of, of uh, Asian pottery is that wonderful business of capitalizing on the accidental, the fortuitous accident. I think it's characteristic that all leech-trained potters and all their offspring want to explore. The whole point is kind of setting up a situation where the fortuitous accident can happen and learning how to coax it into being on a more and more frequent basis. Leach was going to go back to Japan with Hamada, but they decided instead of returning via uh, the Mediterranean, the Suez Canal, and so on past India to Japan, they would continue west and cross the Atlantic, cross America, and then go to Japan from California. My wife said to them, well, look, if you people are going to go crossing America, would you be willing to do some workshops in America? Hamada thought for a while, and he said, if you'll arrange them, we will do them. They swept through the United States at a time when people were hungry for what they had to offer. Up until that time, the functional pots were not recognized as an art form. Hamid and Leach did bring with them the pottery aesthetic, but also the philosophy of how you lived your life. And with that, then, a group of us from the 60s moved out into the country. I remember coming back from England and not having a role model how to run a pottery. I modeled after the leech pottery. I tried to do standard wear and then individual pots, and the standard wear just failed. No, the shops wouldn't buy them. One shop bought, bought some standard wear. They never sent a check, so it just flopped. That was really a blessing in disguise because it brought me to, to making the pots that I really wanted to make in my heart.
The altered form is, to me, how Hamada Leach might have diverged in America away from the way it took form in England. And I would say in America, starting in the 70s, uh, Potter started looking at the form as it is on the wheel and altering it both on the wheel and off the wheel into a new form. Strictly American. I don't think it's ever hit amongst the potters of Britain at all, the way it is a common thing in America. I grew in love with altering about 25 years ago when I went from gas firing to wood firing. And I realized after all the labor of cutting the wood, of cleaning the shelves up, of wadding, stacking, and then the brutality of firing for hours and hours and hours, that I want to invest more time in each piece. And I developed altering techniques. It's not about production pots. I've been there, done that. It's about each pot being different, but cousins. At the end of the day, I'm wiped out because of all the thinking I'm doing, what goes into the piece. I want each one to be, be unique. When I was teaching a summer class at Alfred in 1985, and I challenged the students to come up with a new spout idea, and I also took the assignment. I thought of the pump in my grandfather's cabin in rural Minnesota. As a kid, I loved to pump water from that. It was magic. So I took that exact same shape, I put it on a pitcher, it did not pour. So what can I do? So I had to modify it and modify it and come up with a spout that would pour. Again, function was, was important. And it evolved into one of my signature pieces, the beaked pitcher. The pots I make today would never have been accepted by the Leach Pottery in 1952. Because they, they wouldn't come up to their standard. But for me, they're the pots I have to make. Potter has an attitude about the way he or she approaches clay, and it inevitably comes out. When, when we came home from the leech pottery, having spent two years, two and a half years, making someone else's pots, without a desire for expression in them, you know. Uh, it took us about three years to get over that uh, quality in our work. Since I was at St. Ives, my throwing technique hasn't changed. Adding the decoration in it is something new to me. The sgraffito work that I'm doing is completely new to me. And I don't know that I have technique. I just, I do it as well as I can. What I hope I'm doing, and can't always achieve it, is playing. I'm out to amuse myself 
and amuse others without it going cute. It may go cute from time to time, but I want to evoke not a dated cuteness, <laughs> but cuteness of your, <laughs> if you would have it. Then the face thing just exploded and has just, it's been through millions of ramifications for me. You've always got that two eyes, nose, mouth pattern, and it just divides up space in an endless variety of ways. And then you get the extra bonus of any human face being expressive. But it's, it's not art with a capital A. It's decoration on top of utilitarian pots. And I've always been most comfortable in that arena. She has this strong commitment to her local clientele. One time, Clary called me up and said, Gail, please don't send collectors to my studio or my showroom. <laughs> That's Clary. The strong principles of the Leach principles of, of the pots being uh, for local consumption and the pots be very reasonably priced and affordable to all. And she has stuck with those principles for decades. I would imagine that in talking with those of us who are leech train putters, you've been hearing quite a bit about the past. And I almost wish we could abolish that word because I think what we're about is the continuum. Oh, good, this can be large enough, don't you think? Mm -hmm. What we'll do is right, set it on there. When I think of, of the joy in my life as a potter, it's not the awards, the accolades, it's teaching Charlie, it's passing it on. Let's try one more time. Perfect. First learned about Warren when I was an undergrad at Bemidji State, and um, we had Warren's pots in our collection there. And w learning about Warren and, and the leech tradition was part of our, our curriculum. A lot of the lines and stuff come from a lot of the work, your jars, yeah. that you... Um, He's had these students that have gone on to become potters and teachers, and then they have had students Warren laid down such a, a rock solid foundation and built a, a culture around the functional pot. Yeah, there, there's something that affects you. You know, they're part of your life if you let them be. be. I think in just these troubled times now that these crafts and what we live with are even more important to us. It just connects us and it just brings out our humanity. And the direction in which both as craftsmen and ordinary members of community, we are attempting to find a way in which the function of art can find its modern expression in closer contact with life. We are very visually oriented in our culture. We're not oriented toward the other senses as strongly. And I think that the whole tactile, physical response is as important, I think, as the visual. I've come to it through weaving. The reason that I chose weaving is that I felt that there was a huge area of unexplored territory that hadn't been explored in terms of contemporary art. Leah Cook's work is important because 
She's been making work since the 1970s and really known as a pioneer in the modern fiber arts movement. My background goes from being a, wanting to be an actress to political science. But I always took art, I always did drawing and painting and almost every other art form other than textiles. I think I was like 26 when I learned to weave. I spent a year in Sweden and my purpose there was to learn to weave. I went to a very traditional hand weaving school and it was great. Uh, I, I wanted to work eight hours a day and I learned all kinds of complex, interesting things about weaving that I never would have gotten from uh, the San Francisco Bay Area at the time. I showed my work really first internationally in the biennial. That biennial uh, that occurred in Lausanne, Switzerland was very unique in that you had major people in the field exhibiting alongside somebody who'd never exhibited before because it, you could apply, you could propose something. That's essentially what I did. And then when it was accepted, I did it. And it was a large, interesting work that got a lot of attention. I think my work has changed a lot over time, although I think I see the threads that go through it. I'm always exploring new ideas. Experimenting for what the next step might be. What is particularly interesting about Cook's work is that early on in her career, she went to the history of art and to the history of painting in particular, and she magnified details that you would find in painted reproductions of cloth. So the folds, the laces, the draping. I wanted to foreground textiles, make it the subject matter. Magnifying those details was quite brilliant because painted cloth uh, cannot represent itself the way the woven cloth can because you're using a one-to-one -one medium of cloth to represent cloth. Leah Cook represents a previous generation that found skill to be incredibly exciting. And she has continued to acquire skill, and her new skill set is new technologies. All right. OK. You know, I have to have some technical experimentation, as well as you know, developing a larger uh, context for my ideas. Once I bring it into this program, I have to assign weaves to each color. And I have a file of weaves, and this is what it looks like. So all weaving is binary. It's just the thread is either up or down. Black means up, white means down. So, but these are the weaves that I want to put into the image. When I assign each of them to a color and put them in, you begin to see how it's going to weave. So after I finish with that computer, I bring it over here to the computer in the program that runs the loom. And from this point, I just um, start. Right now I'm in the middle of weaving, so I'm, on, I'm gonna start on thread 773. So, and there's uh, 2,859 weft threads in here. And weft threads are the threads that go horizontal. Loom is a loom in which each thread is operated separately. So there are 2,640 of these micro air cylinders, so every thread can be operated separately. And that's why you can create a full image of any kind of structure you want. quite a while before that computer hand loom actually developed. Okay. 
I think industry power looms pr probably developed earlier, but the, the, the loom that actually was a hand loom that I could use in my work came much later. It's not automatic. You have to make decisions as you go or put in a system of color as you go. By changing the way I weave it, the translation, I actually change the emotional expression of, of what I'm weaving, the face. Over here, we have a good examples of that. These are woven very, very differently. This one to this one to this one. Totally different weave structures. And they're the same image, but they have a different feel about them. Well, I think my work intersects with photography. My mother was a pretty good photographer, so I do have this huge collection <laughs> of family photographs. Like, I've tried to go out and use other anonymous photographs, and somehow it doesn't have the same feeling for me. It's not important people know that they're my family photographs. It's just important to me because I, I like um, exploring it. I'm looking at these photos in detail and looking at expressions and thinking about the different personalities and how we connected. I do feel it impacts the work, but I'm not trying to tell a story to somebody about them. When people look at the work, they make a connection with it. It brings up all kinds of stories and histories that the person experiencing the work has. I was really excited to install her exhibition in the large gallery space. Giving the pieces room to breathe was incredibly important. You would think of how you would install Mark Rothko's paintings. It would be much in the same way. So I wanted to give them their space for contemplation. Yeah, you. So I think mm -hmm. it's really kind of it. It draws it you in. Yeah, and, and yeah. also the way you hung the other ones. There. Yeah, I wanted them to sort of be looking at each other. Right. I'm interested in this continual motion in relationship to the work and how it changes as you move around. It's not a static experience with it, it's, it's an experience in motion. The viewers have reacted to the weavings really positively. I think there's a certain amount of awe when they come into the space, um, and the realization that what they're looking at is a textile versus a photograph. It's a great aha moment for visitors. What the weaving does to photography or the photo is it adds this tactile dimension that you maybe don't have with a sort of a flat print. For one thing, I've always been interested in the brain and how, so it's, it's, a, it's an interest, I guess an interest in what you would call neuroaesthetics, uh, how, how the brain works, I guess. And I had this idea about my work for, for a while about this emotionality of the, of the tactile quality and how that, you know, relates to our emotional experience. And then as it goes to the brain, well, what is the relationship to what's going on in the brain? I'm very interested in the touch part of the brain too. So when people are responding to my work, are they somehow connecting in to this, our sense of touch? And, and our memories of touch. So I went to search for somebody that could do it with me. So basically I found Greg Siegel <laughs> in my search. I run a depression lab and we're mostly focused on understanding who gets better from depression, how to treat people better, and brain mechanisms of recovery. Um, once a year, we shut the lab down and invite an artist to the lab for four days. And the artist gets to use all of the tools of neuroscience to answer some questions about art. Good? Yep. Oh, all right. And remember, okay, look, 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 look. 
Oh. See, we're already just about in. Oh, great. The artist in residence program is done for a few reasons. The big one for us is that we study emotional disorders, we study emotion, and yet as psychologists and psychiatrists, we're given very little training in how to generate emotion. Artists have that training, so we bring them in, and they teach us about what it means to create something that generates emotion. What we give back is we help artists to understand something about their own creation process or how people perceive their art. So, Hi. Leo, check this out. This is dynamic indication of your brain activity. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. So you want to see your alpha. So um, um, if you were to, say, close your eyes for a second, I can see it happen. There. I just did. Yeah, and see it got red. Yeah. And now it's come back. Just from closing my eyes? Yeah, closing your eyes creates a lot of alpha. Okay. Just well, go to sleep. And, okay. Indeed. All right. All right. So, so shall we weave? Why don't we weave? All right. Feed in. Now you're throwing the shuttle. Good. Beating down. Feed in. Today, it was very exciting. We were actually able to observe what was going on for Leah Cook in her brain as she was weaving. Technology that has allowed us to do that is a new generation of machines that measure brain waves. These are electroencephalography, or EEG regs, and it solves a lot of the problems that would have prevented us from measuring people as they do craft in the past. Even. I made a mistake. Okay. Okay. So, so now you can correct, correct the mistake. mistake. Keep going. You, keep going. No, no, I can't keep going. I have to I mean, stop. correct the mistake. Correct mistake. Yes. Uh, just make sure I'm right. Wait a minute. I have to check again. Check and correct. She got frustrated, and a lot of the front part of her brain seemed to shut down. And this is what happens in people when they get clinically depressed. They sit tonically with that front part of their brain shut down. And then Leah got past it. All right. And she was back to weaving. So perhaps if we find this in a number of artists, we can start to generalize about how art therapy might actually be helping people. We set up this experiment in which we try to read the blood flow of the brain while people walk around the museum and experience different emotion looking at Leah Cook's uh, art. For me, I will secure it with a... Uh, we try to, you know, catch those variations with uh, the optical device that we have right here. The fact that they're hand-woven rather than machine-made wovens creates a very interesting challenge because a person would be attracted by the um, instinct of touching to see how it was created and that is going to probably cause a very strong brain response due to the fact that the person is naturally craving for touching the art but they cannot do it. Okay, here. This is pictures of my brain. These show the cross sections. So you can see where these fibers connect in the brain. It's a whole technology that was being used for other purposes. For surgeons, they were looking at you know, fibers in the brain and what you wouldn't want to cut while you were doing surgery. When I first saw examples from this program, I was just blown away by the way it looked like a weaving. And it just took me some totally other place. I just thought, you know, this is very interesting in terms of art and what I could do with that. I think it's particularly interesting that she's gone to the hard sciences, a place where the humanities doesn't stray into very often and trying to not think like a scientist, but rather get scientists to think like artists. What I've been impressed with is the similarities between art and science. Both are creative efforts. 
where the artist goes in to answer a question using one medium, the scientist goes in to answer a question using a different toolbox. The processes unfold similarly. You plan, you analyze, or in this case, create. You step back, look at what you've done, modify, and go do it again until you're happy that what you've uncovered is some essence of truth. I'm almost as interested in how the scientist responds to my work as I am about how the artist or the art critic does. When we measured someone in the brain scanner perceiving weavings, we got a lot of activity in brain areas that are associated with um, touch and feeling. And what we saw was more activity for the weaving in an area of the brain called the amygdala. It's a deep buried brain structure okay. that um, processes emotion at a low level. So the thing where you see a snake and you jump back because you're scared, that's the amygdala network. Uh -huh. Low level emotions and the sort of interoception, body awareness feeling were both right. more active for the weaving than the picture. So that was what I was looking for. So that's pretty much what you were looking for and what you expected. So now I want to do a real study. <laughs> now there was, well, right. So this was one person, we got to do more. Yeah. Science part of it, I think I was uh, of the idea that it wasn't something that I was interested in. I didn't see it as a creative thing. But that's what's fascinating at this point in my life, to have this whole new avenue open up. And that was very exciting for me. And we'll just put this one in, and then we'll be ready for you. Coming soon to Craft in America. The connection between artistry and industry. How the business of craft is remaking communities while dramatically re-energizing old techniques. And later, how artists are forging traditional methods with modern sensibilities as metals are magically transformed by fire as Craft in America continues. Major funding for Craft in America was provided by Cynthia Lovelace Sears and Frank Buxton. L.L. Brownrake. Lillian and John Lovelace. the National Endowment for the Arts, Wingate Charitable Foundation, Stolaroff Foundation. Additional support was provided by the following. Da 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 da